uh, career public health um, professionals uh, who will join me uh, in speaking about smallpox and smallpox vaccination and smallpox eradication. And uh, I'm going to introduce them now, say a few words, and then, then we'll, we'll get into the uh, more formal program. But uh, David Paquette uh, joined the uh, museum uh, after his retirement and returned to Massachusetts. He uh, had both undergraduate and graduate school uh, experience in, in public health. He has degrees in public health and worked in the Arizona uh, State Health Department uh, in the HIV services area uh, and then became the director of HIV and H hepatitis C services in the Maricopa County Health Department, as well as uh, yeah, in the area of preparedness. Uh, he then uh, worked for the CDC through a contractor and has had uh, a large amount of experience uh, consulting uh, both uh, in the private sector and, and for uh, the CDC. Uh, and we are very fortunate to have him as a guide and docent to the museum now. Uh, and Dr. Jason Weisfeld also has been in public health uh, for a very long time. Uh, he uh, went to medical school at the Medical College of Wisconsin. And then uh, after, uh, I guess, your internship, you joined the CDC as an epidemic intelligence service officer uh, in the 1973 year, uh, and then uh, became uh, involved in global public health with the CDC working in Africa and South Asia. Uh, and uh, in particular relevant to tonight's uh, discussion, uh, Dr. Weisfeld was involved in the uh, smallpox eradication effort. Uh, uh, and he, uh, well, I'm not gonna, he, he'll tell you the story, but he was really involved in the eradication of smallpox as he investigated the last case of small endemic smallpox in the world. And I'm sure he'll tell us about that. Uh, and he also has experience in state health departments and was uh, the acting state epidemiologist in Rhode Island for several years in the early 1980s. He uh, retired from the CDC in 1994 and is currently a visiting scientist at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health and uh, uh, is, uh, a, a, um, uh, is a lecturer in uh, medicine at the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth. So, We'll, we'll get to our speakers in a moment. I just want to uh, just uh, remind people about smallpox, or uh, if, if reminding is the right word, just say a couple of words about smallpox. It was a horrendous disease. It was probably secondary only to tuberculosis as a single cause, infectious disease cause of death. Even after vaccination, millions of people died of smallpox around the world every year. Uh, it, it was a rash illness. This is the rash, it was called shoddy because if you, if you rub these, which wasn't recommended, but if you rub these lesions, uh, they actually felt like there was gunshot under the skin uh, and it was a shoddy pustular lesion. The, this rash would evolve over a two week period uh, and um, had a very specific distribution, a centrifugal distribution. The rash was most prominent on the, in the head, the hands and the feet, uh, as opposed to chickenpox, for example, which is mostly on the trunk. Uh, and uh, complications, uh, well, first of all, between 30 and 50% of people died with smallpox. So that it was a major, major cause of death. Uh, and it, it was complicated by secondary bacterial infections, blindness, encephalitis. There was something called hemorrhagic smallpox, uh, very much like hemorrhagic fever. You know, we've heard about Ebola. Uh, and uh, that was almost uniformly fatal. And, were, and pregnant women were particularly susceptible. And then flat type smallpox was also associated with a high degree of mortality and occurred in about 5% of the cases. And that was like a third degree burn. Uh, occasionally people had smallpox with no rash, but 
uh, Dr. Weisfeld uh, will be talking about uh, aspects of smallpox infectiousness. Uh, now I'm gonna, we're gonna start in the 18th century uh, and I'm gonna turn it over to David to tell us uh, about the history of smallpox and smallpox inoculation in 18th century Massachusetts. Thank you all, can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful, I'm trying to get my PowerPoint up, hold on. There we go. Excellent. Can you see? Okay, great. Uh, thank you, everyone. My name is David Paquette, and as Al said, I am a volunteer at the Public Health Museum. I do give, uh, generally I just give tours. Oops, hold on. Whoops. Um, smallpox has a very long legacy of tormenting humans. Our early evidence of the disease comes from the Middle East. Egyptian mummies dating from 1000 to 1500 BC have visible signs of what appear to be pox marks. Now those are very indicative of smallpox and its further skin analysis later on do, does support that diagnosis. It has killed kings, it has crippled armies, it has decimated native populations and it has humbled empires. Now Abu Bakr al-Razi in ninth century Persia was the first uh, to document uh, detailed and accurate descriptions of smallpox. He wrote a book in Latin, which in English um, translates to book on small smallpox and measles. He described the signs and the symptoms of the disease and he's the first to trace the course of the disease and its possible outcomes, which of course include a scarring, blindness and death. He did not address cause or prevention, but we're doing that here today. Now, variolation as inoculation with smallpox is caused had been practiced in China since at least 1549. The common approach was to blow month old scabs up the nose of the patient. But unbeknownst to the uh, practitioners of this, this had the effect of killing off or weakening much of the viral material, reducing the risk of a bad case of smallpox. Now, smallpox inoculation as practiced in the Ottoman Empire was written up by Britain's Royal Society as early as 1714. It was popularized in England early in the 18th century through the efforts of Lady Mary Wortley Montague, who was the wife of the British ambassador to Constantinople. She learned of inoculation practiced in the Ottoman Empire and had her son inoculated there. Later on in 1721, she returned to England and had her daughter inoculated and Interestingly, sure, interestingly, made sure that she was that it was witnessed by a group of British physicians. Now, in the summer of 1721, a smallpox epidemic was raging in Boston. Um, over 100 deaths were being tallied every week in a town of only 10 to around 11,000 people. The ships were not allowed into port. Uh, trade was greatly restricted, and people with the means hightailed it to the country in hopes to avoid the smallpox epidemic. Now, a war of words and wills was being contested between the town's clergymen and its doctors. It was a heated debate centered on a controversial technique that was believed to prevent smallpox, and that was inoculation. It involved the direct transfer of infectious matter from a pustule so it'd be the direct transfer of pus from a pustule of someone with active smallpox to someone who, who did not, to an uninfected individual. This inoculation, it was believed, would create a mild form of the disease in the recipient, who would create an illness that had little chance of causing death. The benefit would be lifelong resistance to smallpox thereafter. Now this was not foolproof. Two to 3% of people who had this procedure uh, died of the smallpox disease or a source of another epidemic, or uh, got a comorbidity such as syphilis or tuberculosis because of the procedure. The chief proponent of the procedure was the Reverend Cotton Mather, a prominent Puritan minister. He was a bit of a fire and brimstone kind of guy, but he was also a scientist who sought to advance the good of mankind with scientific and medical discoveries to improve and save lives, starting with his own fellow Bostonians. Now, I, I, I need to say that Cotton Mather was an extremely intelligent, well-read, learned man. He also was 
was a bit of a doctor wannabe. He was a pseudo doctor and he was um, educated in many, many, di many disciplines of science. But like other religious, religious leaders of the day, he believed in witches and witchcraft. And he believed that illness was caused by sin and cured by prayer and redemption. But he also still believed in science. He felt that inoculation was sent by God, the answer to his prayer. He felt that the science supported his religion and faith. Now, in the late 17th and early 18th centuries, Puritans reconciled science and religion into one coherent whole. The warfare between science and religion, or politics actually, freedom for that matter, is more of a 19th century phenomenon. Um, he believed that God gave humans reason so they could discover the natural laws in God's creation, that thus science would glorify God. So evidence that Mather had a colonial-wide and international reputation as a scientist was his election to the British Royal Society in 1713. Mather wrote to the British Royal Society to say that his slave, who he named Onesimus, whose actual birth name is unknown, who had been born in Southern Libya, had undergone the inoculation procedure. So as Onesimus described to Cotton Mather, he said it was common practice in his native, this is in North, North Africa, that they would take the pus from the pustule of someone with active smallpox disease, scratch it into the skin of someone who did not, they would get a uh, mild form of the disease, would survive, and would therefore have resistance to smallpox for the rest of their life. Onesimus didn't say possibly would have, he was sure that you would have resistance for the rest of your life. Now, Cotton Mather believed Onesimus very, very, very dearly. And he was able to convince his, doc, uh, his friend, Dr. Zabdiel Boylston, to, con to do an inoculation as Onesimus described. So Dr. Boylston inoculated his sl uh, a slave, a slave's son, and his own son. As expected, they got a mild form of the disease, they were quarantined, did not infect anyone else, and they did, they did recover. This was the first inoculations in North America. This was called the Boston Experiment and it got national attention. I call it the world's first colonial clinical trial. Um, it has been cited as, the, as a first great moment in American public health history. So this is by really all accounts a medical mirror, miracle. However, the approach was not universally embraced. The town's clergy were in strong support, its doctors in strong opposition. So its doctors opposed inoculation. I know, let me tell you, let me tell you that story and hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense. The medical men, the men of a science, opposed inoculation on religious principle. It was, they contended, a direct uh, affront to God. They also felt that it was folk medicine and that it really wasn't scientific at all. It was bad enough that the inoculators were going against the will of God by creating, by proposing um, this intervention, but the information came from Muslims and Africans, both seen as heathens by the Puritans. Now, the greatest opponent to inoculation was Dr. William Douglas, who made blatantly racist arguments in disparaging these groups. Dr. Douglas held the greatest scorn for Africans. He believed them to be blundering in an inferior race of man who were deceptive by nature. He was not accepting of any procedure brought to him by an African slave. Now we need to give a little background on Dr. Douglas which to help us understand him better. Uh, Dr. Douglas studied medicine at the most prestigious centers of learning, including universities of Edinburgh, uh, Leiden and Paris. He was the only physician in Boston who had actually taken a medical degree rather than read an apprentice with a practitioner who had been trained in the same way. So he was a bitter rival to Mather and Boylston, advocating for the procedure to be against the law. This, this rivalry played out in print. Anytime Cotton Mather created a newspaper article with his position, it would quickly be rebutted by Douglas. If Douglas put out a pamphlet with his position, Cotton Mather would put out a pamphlet with his position. So the, the good news to that is that we can read all this and see what they were all thinking about. Uh, but today, we would probably call him to be an influencer. He had great credibility among other physicians. 
Several years later, he softened somewhat and agreed in principle to inoculation, but he was pretty much, his bigotry blinded him to the science. Now the ministers advocated for inoculation. They were convinced that true virtue lay in preventing the human suffering created by smallpox. They argued that inoculation was part of God's plan and that the procedure was given to man by God, just as were other medical treatments. Now, by December 1721, the epidemic, the smallpox epidemic in Boston was ending. The virus became a victim of its own success. It infected a total of 5,889 people in a population of just nearly 11,000. So more people were infected than not. 844 persons reportedly died during the epidemic. By the middle of the 18th century, the practice of vaccination had spread throughout Europe and Americas, surging whenever an epidemic threatened. So popularity waxed and waned on a regular basis. It was argued continually throughout the latter 18th century, but it never reached enough people to stop the ravages of the disease. Now, the US suffered an intense smallpox epidemic during the formative years of 1775 to 1782. And in 1777, General George Washington ordered the compulsory variolation, which is inoculation with smallpox, of all new recruits into the Continental Army. Now in England, Edward Jenner was intrigued that many English country folks believed that a bout of cowpox would protect them from life from smallpox. And the matter really rested there until the 1780s when Jenner began gathering case studies of people who'd resisted smallpox years or often decades after contracting cowpox. Now, in a legendary experiment in 1796, he took pus from a cowpox blister on the hair of a milkmaid and scratched it into the eight-year-old son of his gardener. An advantage to Jenner's approach is that it cannot transmit smallpox as cowpox pox is used. Now the child developed a fever and didn't feel well for a short time, but soon recovered. Jenner upped the ante and turned up the heat significantly, and he exposed the child to smallpox in a manner consistent with what Wanzimus had explained a good uh, 80 years earlier. The boy did not get any, did not get smallpox and remained disease free. Jenner wrote up his results in an inquiry into the causes and effects of the variole vaccinate which is Latin for pustule of cows from where we get the word uh, vaccine. And that was published in 1798. So having proven his theory in the benefit, Parliament recognized Jenner as the discoverer of vaccination by 1806. And Jenner is considered to be the father of vaccination. We need to point out, however, that Jenner was not the first to use cowpox to vaccinate against smallpox. Some estimates are that up to 22 others used the technique before Jenner some of the early statistical and epidemiological studies were performed in, as early as 1727 and 1766. And in 1768, Dr. John Fuster reported that variolation induced no reaction in persons who had cowpox. But Jenner was the first to, public, to publish scientific journal findings and formally report to the British Royal Society. So that's probably why he's generally credited with popularizing cowpox, cowpox-based uh, vaccine for smallpox. Now, Jenner's approach also had advantage that the vaccine could be transported. But let us not forget that the idea germinated with an African slave and Puritan minister. Jenner's achievement was the beginning of the end for smallpox, in small part having the privilege and opportunity others did not have. And that's all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. Now I'm gonna take us from the discovery of smallpox vaccine through the following 100, 150 years or so. Uh, and to start with, Jenner's publication in 1798 uh, led to a, a wildfire. I mean, it was, it was uh, amazing how quickly in a, in a world where you couldn't really get very far, uh, except in a matter of weeks, that the world became aware 
of vaccination because Jenner published and people read what he published. And uh, one of the people who read what he published was Benjamin Waterhouse, who is the professor of the theory and practice of physics at the Harvard Medical School uh, and uh, had been uh, trained in uh, England and received his medical degree from the University of Leiden. While he was in Leiden, he actually uh, lived with the family of John Adams and uh, helped uh, with the education of John Quincy and Charles uh, in, in, in the Netherlands uh, while um, John Adams was the US envoy to, uh, the, to Holland. Um, so he, he re, in 1799, he gets the monographs that Jenner published and he sends for samples of cowpox. Now, the, the idea of vaccination was, as David said, is identical to inoculation. You have to take pus from one of the vaccination pustules and transfer it to the skin of another person to inject it into the skin of another person. So for most of the 19th century until the 1870s and later, vaccination was pretty much done from arm to arm. So how would the vaccine get to Waterhouse here in the United States, in, in, in Boston, from Europe. And, and the way it was done was they would take a piece of thread and they would put it in the pustule, soak it in the secretions in that pustule and then dry it and you could send it. And that worked maybe not most of the time, but enough of the time to get vaccine to Waterhouse so he could start vaccinating. And he vaccinates his son uh, and his servants. Uh, and he does the full Jenner experiment. He vaccinates them. And then four weeks later, he brings them to Dr. Aspinwall Smallpox Hospital. Because remember, with inoculation, you also had to have somebody with smallpox to get the smallpox to inoculate somebody against smallpox. So he brings them to the smallpox hospital and has them uh, inoculated with smallpox and nothing happens. So he, he, he demonstrated, as Jenner demonstrated, that the vaccination prevented the smallpox infection from inoculation. So he writes to Adams, but Adams is too busy. He's president, much too busy to respond to his old friend Waterhouse. And he also writes to Jefferson and Jefferson responds immediately, immediately understanding the significance. Every friend of humanity must look with pleasure on this discovery by which one more evil is withdrawn from the condition of man. So uh, Jefferson understands the significance of vaccination and a lot of people do. So vaccination becomes uh, much talked about and much tried. And Waterhouse starts vaccinating people in Boston. Uh, now, th there's some controversy to that because he tried to monopolize uh, vaccination. So he tried to be the one source of vaccine, vac the material, uh, and to, to start people on vaccinating people from arm to arm. So that became kind of controversial. There was a lot of politics involved at the time. Uh, and the Boston Board of Health, which was uh, organized in 1798, so it was relatively new, uh, needed some convincing about vaccination. So they, what was pr proposed, what became the Noddle Island experiment. But ultimately Waterhouse is called the American Jenner because he was the main driver of the popularization. So he vaccinates his children and his servant. He brings them to Aspen Wall's um, hosp uh, isolation hospital. Uh, and Aspen Wall said, this is no sham. It's gonna put me out of business because you won't need uh, isolation hospitals. You won't need inoculation anymore. And that's how Aspen Wall made his, um, his living. And uh, Waterhouse, 
uh, has tickets to get kinopoc inoculation. What is kinopoc? Kinopoc is an old English term for cattle. So uh, it, rather than call it cowpox, it, it was called generally actually kinopoc. And, and by 1803, by the way, Jefferson was writing to Meriwether Lewis saying, before you go off to the West, you should get some of this kinopox material and vaccinate because that will be uh, important as you go across the country and it'll be protecting your uh, great uh, ex exploration. Uh, the Noddles Island uh, experiment was done on Noddles Island. This is Noddles Island in Boston. It's now East Boston. Uh, and it, it was originally proposed to be done on Rainsford Island down here, which was where the isolation hospital, the city isolation hospital, where they would send people with smallpox uh, to be isolated. But the, the commissioners who were appointed by the Board of Health didn't want to have to go back and forth to Rainsford. So they did the experiment on Donald's Island. They took 19 boys, some of them the children of Board of Health members, commission members, uh, and they vaccinated them. Then they, on Noddles Island, they brought two other boys there and they inoculated them with smallpox. Then they tried to inoculate the vaccinees with smallpox from those two children. So there were 21 young boys involved altogether, 19 vaccinated, two inoculated, uh, and no success in giving smallpox to the vaccinated. Uh, boys pr proving beyond anybody's doubt at that point that um, vaccination worked. Uh, and as I said, it, it became a sensation around the world. Uh, Francisco Javier de Balmas, uh, under a royal charter, um, brought 24 orphans from Spain to the New World and ultimately brought vaccination to all the way across the Pacific as well. And what they did was they, they vaccinated two of the orphans when they left Spain. And then every 10 to 14 days when the, the pustules were just right for getting the vaccine out of the pustules to vaccinate others, they would vaccinate another two orphans and another two orphans, et cetera, across the Atlantic uh, and then vaccinate people. Uh, in South uh, America and the Caribbean, and then uh, across the continent uh, to the Pacific, uh, and then off to the Philippines. So the, the, between 1800 and 1809, vaccination really took off across the world. But again, it had to be from arm to arm. And the difference between vaccination and inoculation, inoculation gave you this case of, essentially a case of smallpox, but a mild case relatively limited, although you could, you could still die from smallpox and it could still spread around. Whereas vaccination just gave you one pustule that to this day is called the Jennerian pustule after, after Jenner. Uh, and the, the inoculation or the vaccination was introduced with lancets. Now these were originally used to bleed people to cut into veins and allow blood to flow, but they were also used to to vaccinate. And in fact, I can remember being vaccinated as a child because my initial vaccination before I would have been able to remember didn't take. So in other words, I didn't get a genarian pustule. So the vaccine didn't take. And that, that's always been a problem, especially in the early days with shipping the vaccine on those threads, sometimes the vaccine virus would die. Uh, but I remember being vaccinated with what looked like a nail that was punctured into my arm over and over again. This is probably somewhere around 1952, I think, uh, but it, it, it's still in my memory. Uh, but I got a good take and I was vaccinated and I have, I have the scar to this day. So Massachusetts, uh, as was often the case, led in the promotion of a vaccine and the promotion of public health surveillance for smallpox because uh, you couldn't just vaccinate. You also had to identify cases and isolate cases still because cases occurred uh, because not everyone was vaccinated and people would, would uh, show up who weren't vaccinated. But Massachusetts, in, in actually it was 1810, that the law took effect, uh, required 
each city and town in Massachusetts, each uh, jurisdiction to uh, appoint two vaccinators and everybody to be vaccinated. Uh, and that continued until 1837 when there was, and this is, this is typical. Now, one of the reasons we're doing this program is we want to uh, give you some uh, parallels with our recent pandemic experience. When, when smallpox wasn't really occurring, so well, we don't have to vaccinate anymore. There's no smallpox. So they actually repealed mandatory smallpox vaccination in 1837. And it wasn't until 1855, it became compulsory for school, school entry. Uh, and then by 1894, you couldn't go to school. They'd keep you out until you were vaccinated. So throughout the 19th century, there was these requirements, which were sort of off and on. And what was the effect? Well, here we see uh, the rate of smallpox in, in Boston. Now, this is uh, compared to 1721, when the rate of smallpox was 7,730 per 100,000. This is between 50 and 200, 300 per 100,000 uh, in Boston. And you can see the rest of the state, less smallpox, lower rate for the state as a whole. And this includes Boston as well, because the population density in Boston sort of allowed for more widespread transmission of smallpox. So smallpox was worse in the city of Boston uh, in, in, the, in the 19th century, and for that matter, in the 18th century as well, because of that population density. The rest of Massachusetts was less densely populated. Even, even the cities were, the other cities, at least until the full full blown industrial revolution were less densely populated. But here, here is the impact of those mandatory requirements and their repeal. So between 1811 and 1837 when vaccination was compulsory, the rate was very low. It was around, around 10 per 100,000 at most. And then with repeal, smallpox came back again at a, at a rate about 10 times during the in the epidemic periods, because every four years there would be some sort of smallpox epidemic. Uh, and then in 1855, the school entry requirement was put into effect, but smallpox was still occurring in Boston despite the school entry because school entry wasn't required. So school attendance wasn't required until uh, 1871. And uh, then school entry vaccination was was mandatory, school attendance was mandatory. So you got a large proportion of the population uh, getting vaccinated and, and much less smallpox over the ensuing time period. Uh, and this just summarizes that, that impact. So you can see that requiring vaccination did have a big impact on, on public health and a big impact on the rate of smallpox in Massachusetts. Uh, and then in, in, in the 1870s, actually, I have to say, um, the Italians started to make smallpox vaccine on the, sides, uh, on the side of, of calves in the 1830s and 40s. So the, the, there was a proof of concept here, but it wasn't adopted in the rest of Europe and in North America until the 1870s. So here, instead of going from arm to arm to vaccinate, so if you were a practitioner in Massachusetts, what you would have to do is vaccinate it from one patient to another. You could make the vaccine on the side of a calf because the vaccine virus would grow. They didn't know it was a virus, but they knew they could grow that lymph. They could, they could uh, harvest that lymph that contained the vaccine uh, and vaccinate people uh, from what became a commercial product. So there was commercial vaccine from the 1870s on. And actually the first one in North America to make a uh, commercial calf lymph vaccine was Henry Martin right here in Boston. Uh, and that product was used in that, that peak of smallpox you might have noticed in between 1871 and 1873. Uh, and uh, because it was so successfully used, uh, other manufacturers came into the market and, 
and ha Henry Martin did quite well for himself in making the vaccine. Now that 1870 epidemic of smallpox affected uh, a good part of the United States. Uh, and um, the, in fact, uh, Dr. Michael Wilrich from, from Brandeis is going to be talking at the Boston Medical Library. It's a, it's a virtual uh, lecture next Tuesday night, the 12th. If you go to bml.org, you, uh, you can register for that. But he's going to be talking about that, that epidemic because it had a huge impact uh, on, on the country. Uh, and Boston was severely, severely hit. Now, uh, two things came out of that that epidemic. One was the commercial vaccine um, was not the quality of commercial vaccine. Now, now with arm to arm vaccine, as David mentioned, you, you can get transmission of syphilis and hepatitis. Uh, and that was true with, with vaccine as well. So yeah, whenever you're moving body fluids from one person to another like that, you're gonna get transmission of bloodborne infections. And you're going to get super infections with bacteria and other things on the skin, even from person to person, complicating your, your vaccination. And the commercial products, uh, unfortunately, in the middle of that big turn of the 20th century epidemic, where it was giving people things like tetanus and other infections. So the quality of the commercial product was in question. So Dr. Theobald Smith, who is the director of the Massachusetts Biologics Laboratory, decided that the state should manufacture smallpox vaccine and provide it free to the, the residents of the Commonwealth. So he built the Biologics Laboratory in 1804. This building, which unfortunately was torn down last year, uh, to make smallpox vaccine. So uh, Theobald Smith realized that he could uh, guarantee the quality of the product to avoid those complications. And the, in the meantime, the federal government passed the Biologics Act of 1902 to uh, license manufacturing. That's even before the Food and Drug Act of 1906. So, uh, and, and he was so visionary that he, he realized that it would, it would connect the Department of Public Health that ran the biologic laboratories and the practitioners in the community because they would come to get their vaccine at the health department. And, and the vaccine was distributed through the local health departments. So that connection was made. And to this day, we have a universal vaccine system where all the pediatrics, childhood vaccines that are required are provided for free in this, in this state. Uh, and that started back way back in 1904 with the manufacture and distribution of the smallpox vaccine produced by the state. The other thing that happened was there was a lot of controversy uh, because you can imagine in, in 1901, 1903, when these small cases, pox cases, it was at the height of immigration. Um, and there were people who resisted vaccination. There was forced vaccination. There was required vaccination. There was a fine if you didn't get vaccinated, raising a lot of controversy. And again, if you tune in to Dr. Wilrich's talk next week, uh, you can hear more about that. But that's just to say that this man, Henning uh, Jacobson, who was a Lutheran minister in uh, Cambridge, in fact, his church is still there, um, he refused to get vaccinated. He said he refused because he had a bad experience with vaccination as a child. Um, but uh, we do know that he had very expensive attorneys and we don't think he was paying for them to challenge the constitutionality of public health police power to require vaccination, to mandate vaccination. That had never been challenged before. In, in the entire history of the Republic until then, nobody had questioned whether public health could make that kind of requirement. And that went to the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts. He lost, he appealed to the Supreme Court. And in the 1905 decision, 
of uh, Jacobson v. Massachusetts, the Supreme Court upheld the authority of the state to require certain interventions to protect the community from disease threats, including vaccination. But they didn't say that was a, uh, you know, the, it was, uh, there had to be some uh, controls on that. So it wasn't absolute. Um, the, the, it had to be necessary, it had to be, had to be reasonable, uh, and it had to be proportional to the risk, uh, and uh, it had to be done in a way that avoided harm, harm to people. But that, that, that epidemic in, at the turn of the 20th century uh, led to Massachusetts producing vaccine and this important uh, public health decision of the Supreme Court. And because Massachusetts did such a good job uh, and compared to states that did not require vaccination for school attendance, because after the, after the epidemic, the requirement basically was based on school entry, uh, Massachusetts had the lowest rate. And by 1972, when uh, smallpox was under such good control uh, in the Western hemisphere and in large parts of the world, but before eradication, the, the school requirement that was in effect since 1895 uh, was repealed. Uh, and uh, in 1974, uh, the Massachusetts Biologics Laboratory ceased making smallpox uh, vaccine. Uh, the last epidemic of smallpox occurred in Fitchburg in 1932. Uh, and this was an interesting epidemic because it occurred uh, in uh, an immigrant community uh, and uh, that was very suspicious, uh, probably with good cause of, uh, of authority, uh, but resisted uh, identification as having smallpox uh, and the fact that there was an epidemic. So it, it, the, the cases got somewhat out of hand before control measures were instituted. Uh, but that was the last outbreak. The last cases occurred later in that same year out in uh, Berkshire County. Uh, and then since, since then, there's been no case of smallpox identified uh, in Massachusetts. And the last big, big epidemic, or was actually not so big because control measures worked so well, was in 1947, when uh, 7 million people were uh, vaccinated in New York City because of exposure to a case of smallpox imported from uh, uh, travelers to Mexico uh, at, in, in the matter of uh, a number of weeks. Uh, and, and that was the last uh, smallpox outbreak uh, in the United States. Uh, and this just demonstrates that the outbreak in Fitchburg actually wasn't rec recognized until uh, it was already uh, practically over, but it, it could have continued uh, along if, if isolation and quarantine and vaccination weren't implemented. Uh, so I'm going to stop there and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Weisfeld to, to take up the story. Uh, we're not quite where I left off, but a few years later. Thanks so much, Al. I hope everybody can see my screen. Not yet. Not quite yet. Uh, something like that. No, you have share screen? Yeah, I did. Did it go up to the top with a little red thing? I need to. I need to get some technical terms. <laughs> so, Jason, um, click on share screen, the green button with the up arrow, and then uh, you know one of your options should be either desktop or PowerPoint. No, I'm blank here. Thank you. 
Jason, we have uh, we have several screens for you. Several. Ah, there it is. Beautiful Vermont. Thanks so much. Yeah. Well, good evening, everyone. I hope that uh, you're uh, enjoying the evening. You probably need a little stretch, and I appreciate your patience, but. Uh, I'd really like to uh, take you into some of the depths of uh, the last stage of the global eradication program. I was really very privileged to be able to participate as a young trainee at CDC, being seconded to WHO. And uh, my experience and, and my vision of the last stages of the program really recognized the contributions of the populations that suffered, their colleagues who worked so hard to uh, endeavor to use modern techniques and technological developments to control transmission in their own communities. And you've heard about the devastation of the disease and it was a quite frustrating experience for a young medical officer in the field to really not have a specific therapy to offer and really emphasize the importance of prevention and the ultimate uh, power of vaccines. Uh, I'm just presenting my own views and have no conflicts to declare. Uh, the variola virus, sometimes variola, is a DNA virus of the orthopox genus. And this is the organism, the agent, that caused havoc through history that you've heard about, princes and peasants alike. Dynasties overwhelmed and uh, governments overthrown. The outcome of wars determined by uh, a viral particle that offered many advantages uh, to us for being a candidate for eradication. The uh, disease is transmitted primarily by the respiratory route, but the reproductive rate or the R naught is basically between two to five, which is moderate, a little bit more than uh, the COVID virus, but much less than the measles virus. It was only transmitted person to person. There was no animal reservoir. Uh, the, Disease itself was easy to recognize. You've seen the rash. It was uh, somewhat straightforward to train local staff to differentiate smallpox from chickenpox and uh, to really take measures at the local level to uh, interrupt transmission. There's uh, no asymptomatic uh, presentation of the disease. Uh, just about everyone had rash and even the Sini eruption was uh, quite apparent. And uh, the disease really uh, offered many advantages as a candidate for eradication. When the museum raised the question of how really did the disease disappear, I think it boiled down to these six basic ingredients that very fortuitously came together. And I'll try to breeze through some of the highlights of each of those elements. The International Task Force for Disease Eradication has subsequently developed these criteria for eradication candidates. And smallpox met them so elegantly. There was no vector, there was no carrier, they had a uh, effective vaccine, although it wasn't that safe in those days. Uh, there was easy surveillance because the rash on the face was difficult to hide. There was an international commitment to uh, eradicate this disease. The economics proved uh, overwhelmingly advantageous. Uh, in retrospect, the U.S. recovers its investment every three months and uh, four times a year, times 45 years, we've had uh, 1,800 uh, years of uh, re cost recovery. 
1,800 times. And of course, the humanitarian impact of avoiding all the death and disability and blindness. In 1945, when the United Nations was developing, you can see that smallpox was still endemic throughout much of the world. US and Mexico were involved, most of Latin America, all of Africa, a cluster of countries in Europe, the Middle East, and South Asia into the Western Pacific. In 1958, the Soviet Union proposed a resolution at the World Health Assembly to create a smallpox unit, but there were two staff members and very limited budget, and they still had these 60 countries to uh, consider. It was an untenable proposal that uh, really didn't show much progress. In 1966, the US and the USSR determined to cooperate in the UN International Year of Cooperation and to mount a substantial unit at WHO Geneva to uh, establish the smallpox budget into the regular budget of WHO and to mount a field staff and uh, explore whether mass vaccination could achieve global eradication. The uh, USAID was uh, designated the funding agency within the US government and they contracted with CDC to uh, focus field teams on the 18, eventually 19 countries of West and Central Africa in what's now referred to as the intensified campaign. And medical epidemiologists and uh, what we refer to as public health advisors who are administrative officers and logisticians were uh, oriented and uh, went through language training and were deployed to those 19 countries and many lessons learned in those years from 66 to 70 really uh, developed the final strategies that achieved eradication. By 1970, only Nigeria remained in West and Central Africa and they interrupted transmission the following year in 1971. And the lessons learned there were really applied in the remaining endemic countries. By 1973, there was a huge house-to-house uh, -house survey in India, which demonstrated hundreds of thousands of unreported cases in the north, in Uttar Pradesh, in Bihar. And in 1974, the Indian government was persuaded to uh, invite international collaboration and to change their national policy from mass vaccination to surveillance and containment that uh, had been developed during the Biafran war in uh, Nigeria. And uh, field teams were deployed to India. And uh, this is exactly when I became involved myself as a young EIS officer. So over the course of uh, those final years, you can see the degradation curve of uh, how countries eliminated transmission. The shaded columns are the African nations and uh, the total was of over 60 in, uh, back in 67 or no, in 58. And then uh, in 67, the arrow here shows the beginning of the intensified campaign and the steady decline of uh, endemic countries. As Al described, uh, vaccine production was a pretty nasty process, even into the 1960s. And here's the uh, tables with the calves and the lymph being extracted in Bangladesh. <clears throat> 
Some laboratories used uh, inoculation of chick embryos, but it was a manually uh, demanding process. And sterility became a problem. And you can see the uh, lifelization process where uh, vaccines were freeze dried to make them heat stable. And so we did not require a cold chain in the field, another uh, great advantage. And uh, when the program developed at WHO in Geneva, one of the first challenges they had was to try to standardize the quality of vaccine and a technical advisory group was appointed to travel around. There were great sensitivities that some nations took pride in their vaccine. And when the potency testing or the sterility of the product was questioned, uh, it took some arm twisting to uh, improve procedures. A global laboratory network was established with uh, reference labs in the Netherlands and Canada and uh, regional labs to uh, verify cases and to develop uh, procedures for field examination of patients. The uh, Lyphalyze vaccine was in extensive use after 1968 and pretty much exclusively used after the early 70s. And the development of the bifurcated needle by uh, Benjamin Rubin at Wyeth Pharmaceuticals uh, really made the application of the vaccine so field worthy and uh, really an appropriate technology that we could train young adults in endemic villages to take responsibility for vaccination and sterilizing the needles. And it was something that uh, they could take pride in and really interrupting transmission in their own communities. This was the way vaccine was delivered to us in the field. And uh, the Soviets uh, take great pride in uh, the fact they provided over 100 million doses of vaccine throughout the years of the program. Uh, you can see the prongs of the vipercated needle that uh, through capillary action would draw up just the right dose of vaccine that could be uh, applied by a multiple puncture technique, usually in the upper left arm. The vaccine also leaves a scar when it's a major take. And so uh, that's a very convenient indication that an individual is protected. And uh, another advantage of the smallpox program made uh, great use of it. those 5% that did not uh, convert could be re-immunized. So the program in Western Central Africa was launched with great fanfare. Uh, all the nations uh, developed a national movement to involve the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Animal Husbandry, the uh, Ministry of uh, Labor were all uh, corralled into cooperating in their own sectors and promoting immunization and uh, trying to improve surveillance. You can imagine uh, the uh, impact of fleets of vehicles like this being provided by USAID to uh, somewhat impoverished Ministry of Health budgets in Africa in the mid 60s. And uh, even subsequently, when I lived in Northern Nigeria in the 80s, I saw some of these old Dodge trucks still being used and uh, being rehabilitated. At the uh, beginning of the West and Central African project, the strategy was mass vaccination and jet injectors were initially employed but uh, they were proven to be very difficult to maintain. The nitrogen cartridges were difficult to uh, transport. The nozzles were getting uh, plugged and there was some concern about uh, transfer of percontaneous 
transmission of uh, bodily fluids. And so they were disbanded pretty quickly. But in uh, very cooperative communities in the uh, North Africa Hausa culture, for example, advanced teams would uh, meet with village elders and community leaders to uh, coordinate the schedule of uh, immunization, immunization days. Here you see uh, older children and men in one line who are getting just smallpox vaccination and then younger children with their caretakers who are getting both smallpox and measles immunization. So at the request of the African ministries, uh, it was a combined smallpox and measles program. In each culture, uh, health education materials had to be developed that were appropriate and uh, translated into the local language. And cultures had to be respected. Uh, there were gods and goddesses that uh, represented smallpox in many cultures. And uh, some communities felt very seriously about uh, not upsetting their deities. In 1968, Dr. Bill Faggy, who was working with the Lutheran Church at that time in uh, East Africa, in uh, Eastern Nigeria, uh, realized that uh, the supply chain was endangered, flights could not operate safely during the war, and he was running low on vaccine and uh, had villages that had at least 88% coverage with still some low level of smallpox transmission. So he basically applied the law of Willie Sutton. Willie was a bank robber and he kept robbing banks and uh, getting put in jail. And somebody asked Willie, well, why do you keep repeating and robbing banks? And Willie said, well, you go where the money is. And Faggy applied that to smallpox, you go where the disease is. And so rather than using mass vaccination and uh, in somewhat of a military fashion going from village to village, he retained the vaccine for where outbreaks could be confirmed. And uh, through an iterative process and uh, feedback from colleagues and national counterparts, a very uh, systematic approach to containment was developed and the international strategy for eradication was therefore changed from mass vaccination to what we refer to as surveillance containment. You'll understand from this schematic why it's often referred to as ring vaccination. But I think uh, surveillance containment is preferable because we really want to emphasize that surveillance is critical to identifying possible sources of transmission and then really putting a comprehensive containment exercise to uh, follow up over really a six week period. We, we maintain surveillance of every endemic village until the last scab fell off because we were really trying to interrupt every chain of transmission. But participation of the public was essential, of course. We were guests in the endemic countries. We were working within the Ministry of Health of those countries. But uh, the involvement of every community and uh, affected family and the local officials were really critical to the success of the program. I mentioned how a multi-sectoral national movement was created. And there were key public and private partnerships where not only Wyeth, but uh, Tata Industries in India and uh, other NGOs and community support organizations in developing endemic countries all participated at the local level and uh, provided essential resources. There were rare instances of vaccine hesitancy Paul Greenow has uh, written about the opposition to smallpox vaccination at the end of the program. 
And I think those were rare instances of misunderstanding, sometimes religious uh, conflicts, and uh, perhaps in rare instances, cultural dis disconnects. But uh, for the most part, uh, there was overwhelming cooperation and collaboration. Uh, Sanjoy Bhattacharya, who leads the WHO Global Health History Project, has uh, researched the archives of correspondence between WHO Geneva and uh, the Southeast Regional Office in New Delhi, and has written about uh, the arm twisting and the finessing that was required to uh, challenge the nationalistic tendency in India to resist international epidemiologists and to uh, retain its strategy with mass vaccination. But uh, I, th I think for the most part, uh, there was sincere co collaboration and cooperation internationally. It was exceptional during the Cold War for the US and the USSR to cooperate in, in any regard. And we have to recognize the hundreds of thousands of uh, staff from the endemic countries who labored month after month, house after house, to look for cases, to uh, really search in markets for rumors and to take detailed information. And we would send out teams to uh, verify whether a rash and fever occurred and uh, if it was likely to be smallpox. Schools were particularly helpful. Children were very forthcoming in knowing who was coming to school and who was absent, which uh, house might have somebody that was ill. And they were really uh, unabashed about reporting. And of course, the uh, hundreds of thousands of vaccinators uh, female vaccinators were critical in Islamic uh, communities in Afghanistan. Uh, they worked with female Peace Corps volunteers and uh, throughout all the programs, uh, the local level vaccinators took pride in their involvement in such a successful endeavor. The population density in India, of course, was a major consideration, not only uh, railway stations, but uh, huge festivals uh, drew hundreds of thousands, if not millions of participants. And we had to do surveillance and be prepared for uh, isolation and vaccination where indicated. You've heard of shoe leather epidemiology. Well, sometimes barefoot is a little preferable. Uh, our team leader took the prize of falling off a bridge like this six times in one day. But uh, I remember having wet boots myself on occasion. Sometimes we could travel on dry land, uh, but sometimes it was pretty precarious. I would usually walk ahead of the driver in an instance like this. And again, relying on public participation was critical. In uh, the final outbreak of Varila Major in the Bola Island area of uh, Bangladesh, we traveled on country boats that were sometimes a little overcrowded. In Somalia, we uh, stationed staff at water holes where uh, nomadic populations came to water their animals. And we investigated rumors of rash cases and tried to vaccinate whoever we could. Uh, one of my colleagues at the end of the program in Somalia lived with this nomadic group for six weeks to ensure that uh, their active cases did not escape and expose anyone else. We had a sense that we were uh, reaching the final stages of transmission. And we came up with various uh, metrics to assess our own performance. 
Uh, we met every month or six weeks as a group to share experience and to uh, iterate uh, our achievements and to address our obstacles, to redeploy staff for uh, speedboats or drivers. And you can see when we look at uh, outbreaks that had cases more than two weeks after the report of the outbreak, in Bangladesh, we had pretty steady improvements over the end of 1974 to the elimination of transmission by October of 1975. The numbers at the top are the total number of outbreaks that month. And uh, the y-axis is the percent of failures. And so we had a really steady performance. The uh, reward system was used in select countries. This is a poster advertising a reward for 250 taka. And then we could measure our performance also for health education by monitoring the change in the value of the reward. So here you'll see below that the reward began at the equivalent of $6 and then increased to 15, 30, and 60. And our uh, monthly supervisory visits would uh, inquire with households, their knowledge about the adequate current uh, value of the reward. And at the end of the program, we were reaching about 90% public awareness. So on the left, you see the uh, last case of Variola Major, Rahima Banu. And uh, we were very privileged. This is her with her family uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, we were very privileged that she and her eldest daughter visited uh, the 30th celebration of eradication in Geneva in uh, very gratifying to know that she survived and her next generation survived. And then as uh, Dr. Di Maria mentioned, uh, Ali Mao Malin was the last endemic case of smallpox in the world. He was a cook at the district hospital in Merka, Somalia. And uh, he had been vaccinated, but it was not a take and nobody checked his arm for a scar. He was uh, asked after hours to accompany two active cases in a Toyota Land Cruiser to the smallpox team leader's house. Uh, we estimate it was about a five minute ride in an air conditioned vehicle. And uh, that exposure resulted in his illness and uh, Fortunately, he was diagnosed and isolated and uh, represents the last endemic case. Again, there were uh, two laboratory cases in Birmingham, UK in 1978, but uh, Ali is recognized as the, the last endemic case in the world. And uh, he subsequently worked in the polio eradication program and uh, unfortunately expired from malaria just a few years ago. And what has it all been about? Healthy children, no more scars, no more need for smallpox immunization, and a legacy of optimism to challenge some other diseases for global eradication. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jason. And um, we now bring uh, David back. We have some questions. We have a few minutes. Um, actually, the uh, first question is what happened to the two boys on Nautilus Island who were inoculated with smallpox? They did, they did fine, just like most people who were inoculated. The, the uh, mortality from inoculation was only about three to 5%, but people were willing to take that risk to uh, never have to worry about smallpox because smallpox could kill you at any age group. So uh, it was like insurance. You took the risk, you paid the price to take the risk to prevent 
uh, the uncertainty of smallpox. But it also relates to another question about uh, vaccination. Those two kids who were inoculated with smallpox had lifelong immunity. But as discovered in the first 20 years or so after vaccination was introduced, vaccination is not lifelong protection. And that you can get smallpox, you can get breakthrough smallpox after vaccination. And if you are in continued exposure or in the case of an epidemic, everybody was vaccinated, whether or not they were vaccinated before. It sort of reminds you of our current situation with COVID vaccine and breakthrough infection and the need for more boosters. Uh, and and uh, we, as we're learning, pretty much all vaccines are highly protective, but may not provide lifelong vaccination. Of course, if enough people in the population are vaccinated, then you don't have transmission of the agent. So you're protected from exposure even to breakthrough infection. Um, and, and I think uh, in general, people in the eradication program were vaccinated every seven years or so, Jason? Well, not necessarily, no, not unless there's an outbreak. <laughs> okay. Um, another question is, um, in, uh, in the map in 1940, somebody noticed in the map in 1945, there wasn't smallpox in Northern Europe uh, and the Soviet Union. I was curious about that. I really can't comment from 45. Yeah, maybe <laughs> it was an artifact of surveillance. Maybe they were distracted by other things. Um, now, uh, a little more about the woman uh, who, the photographer in Birmingham, who was in the uh, whose offices were above the laboratory, the, the, the last human cases of smallpox that we know of. Somebody was, and, and that was back in 1978, uh, not, not recently. And that was uh, uh, Henry Benson, as I remember, was a virologist. I think it's interesting. So what happened was he was working with smallpox in his laboratory. Uh, and it sort of escaped and, and, and from all appearances was airborne transmitted to the next floor where this young woman had her photography studio. She was exposed, she got smallpox, her mother got smallpox, she died, her mother survived. Her father had a heart attack during the incubation period and died of that before he could have, may not have developed smallpox. And Henry Bedson, who was a very famous virology, uh, went out to his garden shed and killed himself. So it was a very dramatic episode uh, and was one of the major reasons why it was decided not to keep smallpox virus uh, anywhere. Uh, but uh, because of the primarily the political situation, the United States and the Soviet Union were the only allowed uh, maintenance keepers or keepers of the smallpox virus to this day, this smallpox virus uh, in a very secure location, both in the United States and in the Soviet Union, and a continued debate about whether that should be the case or not. Um, and Al, uh, let me let me jump in here. There were a couple questions in the chat, not the Q and A. Yeah, that that's was wondering what I was going. if the Thank panel. You. Yeah. So Lewis asks, uh, based on the success of the eradication of smallpox, what lessons can be applied to COVID? And Mary Beth asks, what thoughts do you have about how to depoliticize COVID nineteen vaccinations? How how, uh, how do we achieve um, uh, with COVID nineteen what was achieved with smallpox? And is that even the right question or the right goal? So, you know, Jason, uh, could you compare and contrast COVID to smallpox and why COVID is not eradicable? 
Well, uh, you know, from my understanding, the uh, scientific consensus is pretty clear that uh, we can expect COVID to be an endemic organism that we deal with in the medium term for sure. And uh, we don't know the animal origin yet. There have been uh, multiple associations proposed and uh, continuing investigations that are underway to identify the origin of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. But uh, as far as we know, you know, there is some animal reservoir until further studies are done. I think uh, it's pretty unclear that, uh, you know, that disease could be a candidate, it wouldn't meet the uh, criteria. And uh, there's a question about, uh, were there protests to vaccination in the uh, 1800s? And, and I think, David, you already alluded to the protests that were occurring pretty much as smallpox vaccine was developed. Right. In, in, in the mid uh, to early 1800s, it was waxing and waning, and there was a, a lot of uh, letter writing, etc. So there was, a, there was a war of the words going on, both in, in public as well as uh, in, in print as well. So there, there was a lot of resistance as well as a lot of acceptance. Uh, here's a question. If a person had the vaccination as a four month old baby in 1964, uh, what if any vaccine effectiveness do they have? Uh, if they don't have a scar anymore, well, the scar is there for life, but what, what can they expect if smallpox comes back? That's the question I think. Well, they would, if, you know, if smallpox came back is quite, a uh, speculation, but uh, obviously everybody would be re-immunized. Now uh, we have third generation vaccines developed, which are uh, much safer than testing in uh, small human samples and non-human primates. And uh, we have a stockpile of vaccine that would be uh, de deployed if any suspect case was really uh, a serious concern. So uh, irregardless of the date of your previous immunization, you would definitely be re-immunized. And we attempted to do that about 20 years ago uh, in the, out of the fear that maybe smallpox would, uh, would come back. And um, that didn't last actually very long. So there's a question about the politicization of uh, vaccination, and um, you know, I think that, I think that's a whole nother area, and we're pretty much uh, we have two minutes till eight thirty. So I think we're we're um, limited uh, in the time we have, and that would take much too long to discuss. Unfortunately, but it's for another time. And uh, I want to encourage people uh, to, uh, there, there, there are a number of great books about smallpox, uh, the uh, Pox in the Covenant, uh, which is about uh, Cotton Mather, uh, Elizabeth Fenn's great book on smallpox during the Revolutionary War, uh, Hopkins, uh, pr Princes and Peasants. Uh, and uh, I, I, you know, I think, it, it was evident in the discussion tonight that there are a lot of parallels uh, in various ways to what we've recently experienced and lessons learned from smallpox. And I hope that people will visit the Public Health Museum. Uh, and uh, right now we're open on Thursdays from 10 to two, but uh, you can, uh, uh, some, in many cases by appointment uh, and, uh, there are campus tours on Saturdays now. Go to our website and there's ways of communicating uh, about, uh, about reserving time. And, and uh, maybe we get David to give you, a, give you his tour of the museum. Did one today. Any last words 
Uh, no, yeah, everyone should check out the Public Health uh, Museum website and the, you need to sign up if you're gonna come because we still have restrictions and we still require a mask as well. Jason, any last words? Well, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, participating. I enjoyed the discussion. Yes. I just want to po point out, I don't think he mentioned it, but it was Jason Weisfeld who saw Ali Marlin and uh, did the investigation uh, and found, what, 160 contacts? Yeah, 161. And, and uh, Raheem yeah, I was involved in the containment of Variola Major and the Bola Island outbreak also. So he was there closing out smallpox. So thank you. Thank you both for, for joining us this evening. And thank you, Robert, for the Tewksbury Public Library and all of the libraries that serve our communities. It's, it's been great to be back again. Yeah, thank you so much, Al and Al. Mia Culpa, I didn't really give Al a proper introduction. I wasn't really prepared on speaking. It's okay, tonight. it never occurred to me. I, you know, I, I, think. I, I think everyone knows who Al is, but I did want to mention uh, he's the former medical director of the Bureau of Infectious Disease in Massachusetts Department of Public Health and was the state epidemiologist. So uh, I, I think we buried the lead there. So I want, I want to get that out there. And I also want to thank the, uh, the Danvers Library um, and uh, the Andover Library for helping spread the word about tonight's event. And I put the link to the Wilrich lecture next Tuesday. Uh, it's not on their website. So if you do that link, it'll go directly, uh, directly to the uh, registration. Uh, and I think that's it. Good night, everyone. Thank you all. Robert. Um, yeah, I'll be ending it, Al. Thanks so much. Yeah, no, I just want to say, I think we lost some people, but it was exactly at eight o'clock. And knowing, knowing our audience, I think people were going to the Benjamin Franklin documentary. Okay, yeah, no, yeah. no problem. Uh, I, it still, still went really well. And anyone who dropped off can watch the recording tomorrow. So. Yeah, no, they were Thanks. all apologizing. Okay. Yeah. Thanks so much, Al. Good night. Bye -bye.